Okay, so we have another uh, delightful day and great speaker, Gordon Fain. Uh, we're going way, way back with Gordon. I, I remember as a, a little bit slightly younger fellow uh, to Gordon attending Sarasota and, uh, and Fort Lauderdale meetings. And Gordon will always make a point uh, to, go, to going together for either lunch or for walk. And it, it was pretty brutal because he always had that very insightful questions. Why do you think Rhodopsin does what it does? And, and, and other like that question. But this was uh, really sticking with my mind. I always felt like Gordon is my older brother teaching me about physiology and how much uh, I do not understand uh, as a biochemist looking at entire cells. So we're really delighted. Uh, uh, Gordon has a wonderful career, has been a leader in electrophysiological approaches to vision for, I will not say how many decades, but few. Uh, so Gordon, uh, we're delighted to have you today. And Alex, uh, why don't you just uh, introduce him? Good morning, everyone. My name is Alex from Dr. Poczeski Lab, and I have a pleasure and honor today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Uh, Gordon Lee Fain, a distinguished professor emeritus and a member of the Jules Stein Eye Institute at UCLA. Uh, Dr. Fain graduated with the baccalaureate degree in biology at Stanford University and acquired his PhD in biophysics uh, at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And this combination of biological and physical background found its reflection in the major research interest of Dr. Fain, the electrophysiology of the photoreceptor cells. Dr. Fain is quite impressively pursuing research in this field uh, actually for over four decades now. <laughs> I mentioned this, what Chris didn't want to mention, and with great success, as I will briefly uh, refer right now. Dr. Fain is a pioneer of single cell recordings from rod and cone photoreceptors. He also showed uh, that uh, calcium is the second messenger molecule uh, of the light adaptation process uh, in uh, rod photoreceptor cells. Uh, those and other breakthrough discoveries were published in over 100 uh, Dr. Fain's articles. At least 119 are indexed in PubMed. Uh, to my knowledge, and uh, many were published in such prominent journals as Science, Nature, or Neuron. Dr. Fain received numerous awards, including NIH Merit Award and J. Pepos Award in Vision Sciences, and acquired continuous grant support from the National Eye Institute over his uh, entire career. Today, Dr. Fain will give us a talk about rod saturation, transduction, and photoreceptor degeneration. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our today's speaker, speaker Dr. Gordon Lee Fain. Just uh, one organizational thing. If you guys have a question, uh, please wait to the end of the presentation and send me uh, via chat. Uh, just a note that you would like to ask the question at that time. Uh, we have a pretty good uh, attendance today. It looks like 161 people already signed in. So. Um, Gordon, all yours. Okay, Chris, can everyone see the screen? Is that, uh, are we on? Yes. Yep. I'm yes. Chris, great. 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 Good. Uh, so th thanks uh, uh, very much for this invitation. <clears throat> uh, I regret very much I can't be there in person, um, but um, uh, it's lovely to see so many fam familiar faces. And uh, I, I appreciate this opportunity to talk about this research. Much of what I'm going to tell you uh, is either in press or almost in press and hasn't been published. Uh, and I've got a fair amount to say, so I hope you'll bear with me. Um, I want to talk uh, in the first instance about uh, rod saturation. And what I mean by that is what happens to rod vision in background light. So Aguilar and Stiles <clears throat> in the uh, preceding century show that as you increase background light, rod vision, so, so these are psychophysical measurements on humans, Rod vision follows the Weber Fechner law, it adapts. But when you reach a certain background intensity, the, the uh, threshold for vision uh, goes to the heavens. Sensitivity uh, drops uh, practically to zero. And uh, William Rushton later confirmed these measurements on a rod monochrome map. Um, it, we've seen rod saturation on uh, numerable occasions, as has uh, many other physiologists working on single rods. 
you reach a background level of something like three to 4,000 rhodopsin molecules bleached per second, uh, and the rods can no longer respond to flashes. The channels are all closed. Uh, and, and this is, um, <clears throat> uh, can, can be seen in, in one of my favorite demonstrations of this phenomenon. Um, let's see, how am I, uh, we do it like that. All right. um, so this is from um, the uh, uh, paper of uh, uh, Ronnie et al. from Marie Burns's lab. Uh, and uh, Marie did the whole field a tremendous favor by making uh, a mouse <coughs> which uh, is uh, a GNAT2 knockout. So this is a mouse that lacks the cone transducing. And as a result, uh, there is no cone response. So in this experiment, uh, what Ronnie and all did is to use a very bright flash and to rec record the size of the A wave. And what is that the variable here is background intensity. Okay, so the blue symbols are uh, for wild type. As you increase the background intensity, the responses get smaller and smaller. Uh, and uh, finally, a plateau. And, and these are now a cone responses in a wild type um, animal. The, uh, 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 so, um, I just got a signal saying my internet is unstable. Somebody let me know if, uh, uh, if uh, you lose me. Um, so these are uh, uh, cone responses uh, uh, in a wild type animal after the rods have been saturated. Uh, and in a GNAT2 knockout, um, there are uh, almost no responses here because uh, now uh, we have uh, no cone responses, but the rods have been saturated. And uh, you can see that uh, at a higher magnification uh, up here. Um, these are the cone responses at bright backgrounds and there's almost no rod response. And the idea that rods saturate uh, and uh, uh, move out of the way so that the cones can take over vision is something that um, is uh, 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 dogma really in the field. Uh, you can uh, read all about it in the Wikipedia page on eye adaptation and Davison's book uh, in the web vision article. Um, and so I was very surprised when I uh, uh, went to the European retinal meeting in 2017 to hear a paper uh, from Thomas Mutri's laboratory claiming that rods don't in fact saturate. And this is uh, a, a slide, uh, a figure from there. Um, uh, subsequent paper. These are uh, uh, GNAT uh, three uh, minus minus mice. So these are mice uh, lacking one of the uh, cyclic uh, nucleotide gated channels of the cones, uh, uh, having only rod responses. And uh, these are the background intensities and initial numbers of rhodopsin molecules bleached per rod per second. So the very bright uh, background light. And these are now responses to flashes. Uh, if it 12, uh, 12 flashes and, and the red is the mean, and then a bit later, the same 12 flashes and so forth and so on. And the green dot indicates that there are responses, even in these very bright lights, that are significantly different from zero. So <clears throat> I got back to the laboratory and we sat around the SAM and Ricard and, and Al Mashidian uh, talking about these experiments. And, and Ala and uh, Ricard had just been doing recordings from isolated retinas uh, for the uh, RGR Opsin paper, which we had in Neuron last year, uh, or the year before, um, I guess. Um, and so I, I, we all agreed, let, let's see if we can reproduce uh, these, uh, the Tikka-DG Emperor results. And uh, we had a, a wonderful chamber. This is the Vinberg et al. chamber. Uh, um, this shows um, the uh, uh, capacity of recording from uh, two different uh, mice retinas at the same time, um, which uh, uh, we don't generally do. We record from a single retina, uh, but you can confuse the retina so you can block uh, synaptic transmission. You can oxygenate it. Uh, you can control the temperature. And the wonderful thing about uh, this chamber uh, is that responses are just incredibly stable. We've recorded for hours uh, and, and uh, not seen any change in maximum response amplitude. So uh, Franz Finberg sent us a prototype of the chamber and our machinist then cloned it. Uh, and we have a bunch of these chambers in the lab. So we were all set then to 
uh, to do uh, measurements, we just needed an animal that had no uh, uh, that, that had no cone responses. And so we turned to, to the CPFL3 animal from Jackson Labs. And this is something, uh, so this is from the Jackson Labs website just a few weeks ago, claiming that the CPFL3 animals completely lack cone mediated responses from nine weeks of age on. Great, we had two to three month old animals. Uh, we put them in our chambers and recorded, and here's what we saw. So now first up here, you're looking at the, the GNAT1 knockout animals. So uh, the um, GNAT1 animal, knockout animals don't have any rod responses, of course. And so this is a pure cone response here uh, from, um, these, um, uh, from these retinas. And now below, you're looking at GNAT1 knockouts who are also uh, CPFL3. So they don't have rod responses. And, and according to Jackson Labs, uh, these were three month old animals, shouldn't be any cone responses, but there are, and, and they're enormous. Uh, they're just a lot less sensitive. And so uh, uh, Nora Ingram then subsequently recorded from the cells, this is wild type, these are now the uh, CPFL3 cones, uh, they rise and fall a lot more slowly. Um, uh, and they're something like 200 times less sensitive. But the responses are every bit as big as the wild type. And uh, Jeannie Chen then subsequently showed that um, uh, the transducing levels do drop. Uh, you know, at 14 weeks, there's fourfold less transducing. There is a very slow degeneration uh, uh, of the cones. Um, but um, as you can see, uh, the cones that are there uh, continue to respond. And so this animal was completely unsuited to the experiments that we wanted to do. Well, uh, fortunately, it was at about this point that we got wind of uh, uh, Marie's animals and uh, communicated with her and she very generously sent us uh, a breeding pair. Uh, the nice thing about these animals is that the cones are uh, normal in number and in morphology. They just don't respond to light uh, because they don't have any uh, active transducing. Um, and, um, that made these animals then uh, uh, much more suitable for our, our recordings. So um, we uh, took forever to grow the animals up. You've all been there. Uh, 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 it takes a while. The animals sometimes don't cooperate, but we had pretty good fortune with these animals. And uh, after about a year or so, we had plenty and could start recording. And this is what we saw. So. These are, again, uh, whole retina recordings of isolated photoreceptor responses. We block synaptic transmission. We block the Mueller cell response um, uh, in ways that are, are now pretty standard in the field. Uh, these are the dark adaptive responses. And then we put on a uh, continuous uh, background light um, that um, uh, uh, whose intensity is given uh, uh, above each of the series of responses here. Um, and uh, th these intensities, I should say that the, that the lights, the, the, the lights we're using in all the experiments I'm going to show uh, are uh, between uh, 560 and 570 nanometers. Uh, so in uh, uh, orange, I suppose. Um, but the intensities are given in equivalent photons at the lambda max of the rod pigment. Uh, just as an aside for the condescending, uh, if you want to know the initial numbers of rhodopsin molecules bleached uh, per rod, just divide by two, okay? So here's what we saw. Just after turning the background light off, uh, responses were extremely small. But if we were willing to wait, the responses recovered. And after an hour and a half, they could be as large as 10 to 15% of the uh, normal uh, dark adaptive response. Still not huge, but uh, two to three picoamps in a single rod, something of that order. Uh, and uh, uh, Lynch's lab was right. The rods uh, have a way of avoiding saturation if uh, the light is on continuously. Okay, so these lights, these bright lights were on continuously the whole time. Uh, and um, nevertheless, the, the rods uh, after a certain amount of time could, uh, could produce responses and continue uh, to um, 
uh, to show activity. So now uh, we looked at this phenomenon uh, in a single rod. Uh, these are very difficult experiments to do. You have to hold a single rod for long enough uh, to see a response. And, and uh, this is now an even brighter light than in the previous experiment. And these are responses uh, we recorded uh, average responses from several rods uh, after five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and 30 minutes. Uh, they're quite small, but, but you, uh, the, the, the rods are unlikely to have been saturated in these experiments. Um, if the response had been saturated, you would have seen uh, the response hang up here, and uh, we never saw that occurring. Uh, I should say that in the uh, setup that Ala uh, used to do these uh, recordings, um, uh, that the light isn't as bright as for the isolated retina experiments, and Alan basically ran out of light. But the photoreceptors uh, were not saturating. <clears throat> we just, uh, in previous experiments, we weren't waiting long enough and we weren't looking uh, carefully enough. So, uh, this is so, so just exploring the phenomenon uh, a little bit more. Um, this is now uh, one of the uh, background light intensities that we use. Uh, just to see as a function of time in more detail how the responses recover. And so these are response intensity curves. This is response on this axis and, and uh, uh, flash intensity uh, uh, on this axis, all in the presence of this continuous background light and recordings made uh, after uh, the times shown uh, here. And, and now you can see what is happening at a higher uh, amplification along the ordinate uh, uh, in part B. And so it, it really takes, you know, uh, between uh, an hour and an hour and a half for uh, the uh, response amplitude to come to steady state. It's a very slow process. Um, when we plot it, the maximum value of the response here as a function of time for the different backgrounds and, and sensitivity as a function of time, we found uh, a similar uh, 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 slow increase in maximum amplitude uh, and in sensitivity, uh, which was um, um, bigger uh, uh, for uh, uh, brighter backgrounds than for this dimmest background here. Uh, but this dimmest background uh, nevertheless did show uh, some increase in response amplitude and, and that background uh, will end up having a certain amount of significance. That's about 5,000 neuropsin molecules bleached per rod per second. Okay, so the summary so far is that rods recover up to 10 to 15% of their dark current, even in very bright illumination if it's maintained for one to two hours, okay? This recovery is already apparent at a background intensity of, as I said, about 5,000 neuropsin molecules bleached per uh, rod per second. Uh, uh, the extent of the recovery is somewhat greater as the intensity of illumination is increased. Uh, and for the three brighter backgrounds, sensitivity increased by about a factor of 10 and R max, the maximum amplitude of the response by a factor of about five. So these experiments raise two questions. What process can explain the slow increase in maximum response amplitude and sensitivity in constant background light why is the increase bigger in brighter light? And how can rods continue to respond in the absence of the RPE for long durations in very bright light, which we calculate to bleach nearly all the pigment in a rod? So let's take the first question first. What is the mechanism? Well, okay. Um, Vadim Arshavsky and I have had our differences over the years. But I know his papers, and it was pretty clear <laughs> that this was transduce and translocation. So uh, Vadim and his colleagues, uh, and, and uh, several other laboratories as well, I should say, uh, have shown that the G protein, essential for transduction in the outer segment, moves from the outer segment to the inner segment in the presence of bright light. And this movement of transducing decreases the gain of phototransduction. Now that's just what we needed to explain our uh, phenomenon. And these are uh, from Sokolov et al. 
uh, this is the time course of, of alpha transducing and beta transducing moving out of the outer segment. Uh, you know, takes an hour, maybe more. And this is the intensity dependence from uh, Lobanova et al. Uh, look at that. So, so uh, I should say this fluorescence is labeling the transducing, okay? And uh, I think in, in, in this figure, the alpha subunit are transducing. <clears throat> and you have to increase the light to about 5,000 uh, rhodopsin molecules bleached uh, per rod per second to start to see the uh, transducing move. So the fit was pretty good, but uh, we wanted stronger evidence than that. What we really needed was an animal uh, in which transduce and translocation was blocked. And fortunately we had one. Nick Artemiev uh, had made uh, what he called the A3C mouse. So what, what, what's uh, the, the significant thing about this mouse is that there is an additional uh, uh, S-palmitylation site introduced uh, uh, into the, the alpha subunit of the transducing. Um, so that, that site will attach additional lipid to the subunit and the lipid will insert into the disc membrane, into the outer segment membrane. And that lipid will tend to anchor the transducing more tightly to the membrane and hinder translocation from the outer to the inner segment during light exposure. And that's indeed what happened. So these are again fluorescent measurements of, of uh, either the alpha or the beta transducing. Uh, uh, so this is in the dark and in the light, you can see that there is this very large uh, movement of transducing from the outer segment to the inner segment. In the A3C animal, on the other hand, this movement is very much decreased. And that's true for both the alpha subunit of transducing uh, and for the beta subunit. Well, uh, the movement is decreased, but it isn't eliminated. Uh, the, my Jungder at, uh, at all uh, say that uh, uh, only about half the transducer moved. And, um, you know, uh, still half didn't move. And we were uh, unsure exactly what we would see. But uh, in the event, uh, we saw a dramatic effect. So these are now uh, recordings like the ones you've seen before uh, in uh, a, a fairly bright continuous background light. And these are the GNAT2 knockout animals, uh, which uh, have fully functional rods. And uh, you're seeing this very large increase in uh, response amplitude uh, after an hour. If on the other hand, uh, you record from the A3C animal, uh, which lacks normal GNAT1, and also GNAT2, you see uh, the same effect. But look at the scales on the ordinate. It's tiny. And if you compare directly the uh, responses, <clears throat> the uh, maximum amplitude of the response for uh, the, the uh, wild type, what well, wild type, uh, these are uh, GNAT2 knockouts, of course, um, but uh, GNAT1 wild type uh, with the A3C, you can see for both the maximum amplitude of response here and the sensitivity change, that both uh, are, are nearly abolished. So I think that this is pretty good evidence that the primary mechanism of this removal of uh, um, uh, this avoidance of uh, saturation of the rod response is the uh, translocation of transducin. There may be other uh, contributions as well, but I think we got our handle on the uh, most important of them. And uh, imagine if we'd been able to stop transducin translocation entirely. Uh, I think that the uh, recovery of the rod response uh, would have been gone altogether. So now to the th second question, how is pigment regenerated? So I put this little paragraph here so I wouldn't have to remember exactly what to tell you. Uh, it, it's kind of crux that I learned uh, <laughs> lecturing to undergraduates. Uh, so an experiment I showed later, the retina was exposed for one hour to light of 10 to the sixth equivalent photons per micron squared per second. So it's about five times 10 to the fifth throughout some molecules initially bleached uh, per rod per second. Um, and without regeneration, that would leave one rhodopsin molecule, one, one rhodopsin molecule every 15 to 20 rods. And in experiments we don't show, uh, we've exposed rods for as long as four hours at this intensity. And the rods continue to respond 
much uh, as in figure one. So clearly some mechanism must exist under these conditions for regenerating uh, rhodopsin. And, uh, and, and so we uh, sought, to, sought to try to understand what this, uh, how this regeneration is uh, produced. Well, the first thing we did um, is to make microspectra photometric measurements of the actual amount of pigment uh, in uh, rod outer segments from mouse, uh, from wild type mice, um, and uh, un under the same conditions as our, uh, our recordings. So <clears throat> the Richardson and Carter Cornwall and Carter's lab in Boston, and then was shipped to um, Los Angeles. And um, uh, uh, the measurements here uh, are, were made uh, after uh, exposure of a 570 nanometer light, uh, um, uh, fairly bright light uh, for a variable uh, period of time. And I should say that the, the actual pigment measurements with the MSP bleach negligible amounts of pigment. All right, so what you're seeing are decreases in optical density produced by exposure to this continuous light. And the curves, the data have all been fitted with uh, uh, a, um, uh, the, the, the uh, pigment uh, absorbance curve for the mouse rod pigment. From these data, uh, we uh, have plotted uh, here, uh, Ricard has plotted the uh, amount of pigment remaining uh, as a function of time uh, using uh, the photosensitivity equation. And so this is the fraction of pigment remaining with no uh, regeneration. And the, the fits are practically perfect. So, uh, down to about one to two percent of uh, of remaining pigment, which is the sensitivity of the MSP measurement, we can see no evidence for regeneration of pigment. Well, uh, but nevertheless, pigment is being regenerated. So, how are we going to how are we going to measure uh, the, the regeneration? Um, we used a different uh, approach. So. This is from a paper, uh, sort of a Nymark et al. The collaboration between my lab and Carter's. These are uh, Mike Woodruff's, the late Mike Woodruff's recordings. Um, this is uh, uh, Rod responses in the dark, and then uh, we bleached five percent of the pigment and and showed with MSP uh, that when we thought we were bleaching 5% of the pigment, we were in fact bleaching 5% of the pigment. And then after doing that, we waited an hour and we recorded these responses, okay? And we did the same for 10%, 20, 50, 90% bleaches. The standard uh, bleaching adaptation experiments, which uh, we and Carter have been doing for many years on different species. And um, we then, plotted the sensitivity, the relative sensitivity as a function of frac a fraction of pigment bleach. Uh, now, um, if the only reason sensitivity were declining is uh, from a, a decrease of quantum catch, the decrease in the, in the concentration of rhodopsin in the outer segment, uh, the sensitivity should follow this curve. So uh, uh, if you've uh, um, bleached 90% of the pigment, 10% less uh, left, the sensitivity should be down by a factor of 10. Uh, and, and that's what this curve would predict. But that's not, of course, what the rods do. And the reason for that, uh, as Carter and I showed uh, in the early 90s, is that opsin, bleached pigment, activates the cascade. Uh, it's not very good at it. In a mouse, it's like six orders of magnitude less effective than um, uh, the light addict activated uh, visual pigment, but the uh, visual pigment um, turns around in the membrane, we think, uh, and uh, very occasionally activates a transducer. Uh, and uh, if there's enough bleached pigment, uh, the activation of transducer can be sufficient to produce an equivalent background light. Uh, and uh, what we postulated is that the intensity of this background light uh, is proportional to the amount of, of uh, opsin in the outer segment and activates uh, the, uh, adapts the photoreceptor just as a real background light would do. And from these simple assumptions, you can derive this equation. So I did with 
Gregor uh, Johnson, Carter Cornwall, uh, many years ago, and you can see the fit uh, is pretty good. So uh, what we attempted to do then it, uh, is to repeat these experiments, do exactly what we had done before, um, and, but, but now uh, bleach even more pigment and see what we got. And so uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, these are the, uh, the, um, uh, the data from, uh, these are the data from, from these experiments. Um, this was the intensity of the bleaching light and we bleached 2% uh, uh, of the pigment and then waited 45 to 60 minutes and recorded uh, the sensitivities and did it on several retinas and the data shown here. We did the same for a five minute uh, exposure of 46% bleach, and those are the data here, and so forth, uh, up to a three hour exposure, uh, which bleaches everything. There's nothing left in the whole retina, right? But we were nevertheless getting uh, small responses. So, um, we thought Fredrickson then made a simple model. Um, uh, of uh, uh, pigment bleaching and regeneration. Uh, the dotted uh, red curve is what you expect from the photosensitivity curve uh, for the change in sensitivity. So this is the same uh, uh, curve uh, as, um, let's, let's go back. Uh, it's, it's this curve right here, it's this equation. Um, uh, and, and you can see that past a certain uh, bleaching exposure, past a certain bleaching, this curve predicts that the sensitivity just basically uh, goes to zero, okay? And um, uh, that's not what happens. What happens as we've seen before is that the sensitivity doesn't go to zero, it levels off even. Uh, the pigment also uh, should go uh, practically to zero. Uh, and from uh, Ricard's simple model, uh, he was able, uh, from the sensitivity measurements, he was able to get an approximate value for the actual amount of pigment which must be present in the outer segments of the rods in order to uh, explain the sensitivities we actually recorded. And that the pigment concentration seems never to drop below uh, about 0.1 percent. Well, uh, this is isolated retina. There's no retinal pigment epithelium. We've repeated these experiments uh, on RGR opsin uh, knockout animals, same result. Well, what's going on? Well, the first thing we uh, looked at, the uh, first thing we checked was to see uh, if this same uh, mechanism uh, was occurring uh, in uh, a single rod. Um, and so Alan Mashigian then went back to his suction rig. Uh, he uh, exposed uh, uh, rods for 60 minutes to this very bright light which as I said, uh, should leave one rhodopsin molecule uh, in every 15 to 20 rods, okay? Uh, and, but clearly doesn't do that. Um, then uh, he allowed the photoreceptors uh, to reach steady state for another 60 minutes in darkness. So we, exactly the same protocol we used for the isolated retina, but now a single photoreceptor recorded from suction. And this is a response intensity series. So that the, these are flash responses to increasing uh, lights. And this is now uh, the response intensity curve. And, um, you know, uh, the change in sensitivity is, is bang on that, that we got before. So it looks like the regeneration, uh, whatever its mechanism is occurring within the rod itself, uh, probably in the outer segment. Is it? It is the, the, the regeneration occurring in darkness after the light is turned off? Well, we checked that possibility by exposing the rods to this bright light, turning off the background light uh, for a variable period of time. And these are the uh, recordings at higher gain here. And, and this is now the relative sensitivity plotted as a function of time. And the dashed line here is when the background light was turned off. And you can see that there's a jump uh, in uh, the sensitivity immediately after the background light was turned off. That's probably just removal uh, of light adaptation. But then the sensitivity is roughly uh, constant. Uh, so it doesn't appear that there is any regeneration occurring uh, in darkness after the light is turned off. 
In a final uh, attempt to, uh, to try to understand what is going on, Tang uh, uh, Zhu uh, did some uh, uh, HPLC measurements of retinoids uh, in retinas that had been exposed to these very bright lights uh, for 30, 60, and 90 minutes, uh, measured 11 cis and 9 cis uh, concentrations, which, as you know, can both form uh, visual pigments, and that the uh, amount of retinoid was consistently greater than you'd expect from, from the cones. That's what this dotted line is here. Uh, the cones, of course, are only 3% of the photoreceptors in mouse, uh, and they're uh, um, have smaller outer segments. So uh, it looks as if exposure to light uh, just by itself can produce pigment. So uh, the major mechanism of recovery of sensitivity seems to be transduce and translocation. The sensitivity and time course of the effect are similar and recovery is greatly impeded uh, uh, in the A3C mouse. That some mechanism of pigment regeneration exists within the photoreceptor that prevents the pigment level from ever falling below about 0.1 to 1% of the dark adaptive concentration. And this mechanism is unlikely to be photoisomerization summarization of free all transretinal or photo reversal of a pigment intermediate. Uh, it's unlikely to be photoisomerization summarization of free all transretinal just because the lambda max of that, uh, of that reaction. Uh, of course, depends upon the solvent, but is very unlikely to be uh, uh, um, at, at wavelengths longer than, longer than something like 400 nanometers. Uh, photo reversal of pigment intermediate is unlikely because uh, the concentration of uh, pigment intermediates for long durations of these bright lights should be extremely small. Uh, and um, as, as I said, we uh, looked uh, in our GR ops and knockout animals, um, and we couldn't see any, uh, any difference. Um, we changed the wavelength of the um, uh, of, of the uh, constant background light from 560 to 470 to look for uh, contributions from NRET PE uh, from the NRET PE mechanism. Uh, we saw no statistically significant differences, uh, so we just don't know what's going on uh, uh, at this point. Um, there's some mechanism of generation, but um, we're uh, unsure what the mechanism. Is. All right, why do rods do this? There's no evidence that rods make a significant contribution to visual perception in, uh, uh, in photopic light levels. Um, and why should they? These responses are, are quite small. The ones I'm showing you, um, they uh, are slower uh, than the cone responses. Uh, um, that it just, it's just unlikely that they would, <clears throat> that, that the visual system would use these responses if they could use the cones. And uh, you, you uh, know this from your own experience. Cones, uh, we, we use our cones in bright light because they're faster. Um, if, if you want a demonstration of this, uh, my favorite example is to try running in the desert. Now, this would have been difficult in Cleveland, but now you guys are uh, in Irvine and you can get in your car and drive east for an hour and you're at Ansborego Park, and uh, which you should go to in any case, it's, it's quite lovely, uh, especially in the spring if we ever get any rain, uh, when the cactuses bloom, it's, it's quite something. Well, anyway, try to run uh, in the desert uh, in, in bright moonlight. And you can see all the cactus just fine, but try running. You'll stop immediately because you can't see them fast enough. And you don't want to run into a cactus. I know this from personal experience. Uh, this is not uh, a good thing to do. Now, in bright uh, daylight, it's no problem. You can uh, run all you want. This is the same reason why we don't play table tennis in the moonlight. You just can't see the ball fast enough. Uh, we use our cones. So uh, if uh, the rods aren't uh, if, if this mechanism of escape from saturation isn't being used uh, to allow rods to participate in visual perception in bright light, what is it doing? Well, to give you my, uh, um, uh, my explanation, I have to tell you uh, some ancient history. Now, I mentioned that in the uh, 
uh, early 90s, Carter Cornwell and I showed that bleach pigment can activate the cascade. And about that time, Dominic Lamb and Bob Shadley invited me to a, a meeting in Texas, uh, um, and it was a good meeting, uh, but they wanted a book chapter. And uh, uh, I hate doing these book chapters. Nobody ever reads them. Um, uh, so I confess that in writing the, the, the chapter, I was getting a little bored. And, and so I, uh, I started thinking you know, in a more general way about what was going on. And, and, uh, um, and as I thought about uh, the uh, effect of bleach pigment, uh, I, uh, I had the following idea. Uh, so um, the, we, we knew that uh, constitutive activation of the photoreceptors, so, so constant light can cause degeneration. This is something Noel's lab had shown many, many years ago. Constant, even laboratory lights in an albino uh, rodent can produce degeneration of the photoreceptors. And I was a graduate student of John Dowling, so I knew John's work very well. And John had shown that if you vitamin A deprive, um, a, a rat, that you end up with uh, a retina which has no 11 cis retinal, no chromophore, but the photoreceptors are full of opsin. All right, they're full of opsin. Opsin stimulates the cascade. It's just like a constant light. Uh, and in both constant light and in vitamin A deprivation, you get the generation of the photoreceptors. So maybe there is a, uh, a uh, connection between the two. And so at the very end of this uh, book chapter I was writing, I added uh, some, in, 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 in my original draft, I added some discussion of all this. And in those days, John Lisman and I were reading one of those papers. So I sent it off to my friend, John Lisman. He read the paper. I got an immediate phone call. Uh, John was very excited about the whole idea. And he said, let's write a review. We'll call it the equivalent light hypothesis. And John, uh, as I say, was a good friend. And so I said, sure, John. And uh, so we did. And uh, we even uh, wrote it uh, <laughs> fast enough <laughs> that I was able to cite it uh, in this book chapter before the book chapter uh, went to press. So uh, then what happened is uh, a couple groups made uh, arrestin knockouts and rhodopsin kinase knockouts. And both of these rods uh, have, have uh, light responses which uh, um, decay very slowly. And it turns out that, that uh, the rods in these animals are um, very sensitive to light damage. So that fit with the idea that, that, that we had. Um, but I was, I was quite frustrated because I couldn't get a molecular biologist interested in all of this, uh, interested enough uh, in order to do uh, what I felt was a critical experiment. But then I got lucky. Uh, Michael Redman uh, and his group knocked out this guy. This is the RP65 protein. This is the isomerase, the essential protein in uh, the retinal pigment epithelium that converts all transretinal to 11 cis retinal. And if you knock it out, as Michael Redmond's uh, uh, Michael Redmond's lab showed, um, you end up with a photoreceptor with a, with a retina that has no 11 cis retinal. It's vitamin A deprived essentially. But as uh, Dean Bach, as part of this collaboration, showed the outer segments are full of opsin. So the, the black dots are uh, opsin molecules. This is the uh, RP65 knockout. The outer segments don't look great, but they're full of opsin. So what uh, uh, Michael Redman uh, and his collaborators had done is to produce a vitamin A deprived animal. Uh, and this was great because uh, actually vitamin A depriving a rodent uh, is not easy. I, quite honestly, I don't see how John did it. Uh, but John's good. Uh, we've, we've tried, uh, uh, actually on zebrafish, I think. Sam can tell you that story. Uh, it's just not easy. But we didn't need to do it anymore. We had an animal. And so at that point, I convinced uh, uh, Janice Lim to work with me. Janice, of course, had a GNET1 knockout animal. So uh, she made it. Uh, and she uh, got um, Michael Redman to send his RP65 animals uh, to her to meet the two. So the idea was now you'd have an animal uh, which whose outer segments were full of opsin, but no chromophore. But this animal would also have no 
uh, gene at one, no, no transducing. And so it couldn't transduce, even though it had, it was full of opsin. And so the idea was, well, if it can't transduce, the photoreceptor won't degenerate. Even though, uh, uh, even though there, there uh, is plenty of ops in the outer segment to produce this equivalent background. All right, so then, then I waited because she had to meet the animals and it took a long time. And about a year later, I was sitting in my office on a summer's day and I hadn't heard a word from Janice. And I, I started to think, well, you know, maybe there's a problem here. Maybe, maybe there's a reason why uh, these experiments uh, uh, might not work. Uh, and I sent Janice an email uh, laying this out. Uh, and um, a couple hours later, I got a phone call from her. Uh, uh, Gordon, what are you talking about? These experiments work perfectly. I can still hear her voice. Uh, <laughs> and here's what she got. Uh, so this is from our subsequent Nature Genetics paper. Uh, these, we're gonna look now at the outer nuclear layer, which is where the nuclei of the photoreceptors reside. Uh, and the thickness of this layer is an indication of degeneration. Um, so this is wild type. These are the GNET1 knockouts. Um, uh, this is the RPE65 knockout. You can see after six months, the photoreceptor layer uh, is half as, as, as wide. Half the photoreceptors are degenerated. But if you made the RPE65 uh, animal with a GNET1 knockout, you preserve the photoreceptors. So, uh, we then uh, hypothesize that when there is constitutive activation of the visual cascade, uh, if it isn't too bad, you get night blindness. And, and Alex Dezor and I showed this for the G90D animal um, uh, uh, many years ago. If on the other hand, the, uh, the stimulation of the cascade, either from continuous light, from vitamin A deprivation or the RPE65, uh, uh, knock out uh, if this continuous uh, uh, um, stimulation of the cascade is, is great enough, uh, you will get degeneration uh, of the photoreceptors. Now, we postulated that certain mutants might also produce degeneration by this mechanism, but we now know that these, uh, that the, um, um, that the mechanism here is a bit more complicated. So what does any of this have to do with transduce and translocation? Here's what it has to do with transduce and translocation. The A3C animal degenerates. So this is four months later, looking again at the outer nuclear layer thickness uh, in a uh, uh, normal animal, that is a heterozygote, a gene uh, uh, one heterozygote. Normal uh, outer nuclear layer, plenty of photoreceptors, but four months uh, in an A3C uh, animal uh, in uh, uh, normal circadian light dark, uh, and half the photoreceptors are gone. But if you leave these A3C animals in constant darkness, the photoreceptors don't degenerate. So here's what we think is going on. We think the primary function of translocation or transducing is the reopening of the cyclic nucleotide gated channels in the outer segment to keep these channels from staying closed too long so that the rods don't degenerate. And that transducing translocation may be one of a number of mechanisms preventing rod degeneration. Arresting translocation uh, may contribute. Uh, pigmentation of the eye, I mean, reflect that, that you no. Know, uh, show that constant light, uh, laboratory light in an albino rat uh, can produce uh, complete degeneration of the rods after only a couple of weeks. But Matt Lavelle later showed if you try the same experiment in a pigment in animal, you don't get anything. The rods are fine. Just that little bit of pigment is enough to keep the rods from degenerating. So the rods uh, are <clears throat> on a knife edge. Uh, there, uh, uh, any number of things can cause uh, degeneration of the photoreceptors, and we think that uh, there are a variety of different mechanisms to keep the photoreceptors from, um, uh, from uh, beginning to degenerate. So, um, uh, rods and bright light uh, 
uh, slowly recover 10 to 15% of their dark current. The reopening of the channels is mediated, we think, by translocation location of transducing, at least primarily. The channel reopening uh, and transducing translocation prevents the outer second channels from staying too close for too long a time, which can cause degeneration of the rods. And we think transducing translocation is one of a number of mechanisms that allow us to use our eyes under virtually any conditions of illumination over all the length of our days without damaging our rods. So uh, that's uh, the end of uh, the saturation story, but I don't see how I can give a seminar like this without mentioning this guy. Uh, this is the sea lamprey, Petromycin marinus, and the biologists among you will know that uh, the sea lamprey is uh, a cyclostome, a jawless vertebrate. Uh, its lines diverge from all the other vertebrates in the late Cambrian 500 million years ago. And it is quite remarkable, therefore, that as we showed in Asteridae and colleagues also, uh, that this animal has rods and cones, uh, like our rods and cones. Same sensitivity, same kinetics. Uh, Al Mashidian looked very carefully at light adaptation, adaptation to, to bleaches. Uh, if you put uh, rod and cone responses uh, of um, lamprey on one side and, and frog uh, rod and cone responses uh, on the other and asked a physiologist to tell which was which, uh, no one could do it. Uh, they're virtually identical. So we got interested in another form uh, of photoreception. Uh, and I'll, I, I know I'm practically out of time, so I'll be, uh, I'll be brief here. Um, we're... Uh, uh, we got interested in these guys. The melanopsin containing uh, intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. So as most of you know, there is a population of retinal ganglion cells uh, which contain a visual pigment, uh, melanopsin, that can produce a light response quite independently of the rhodopsin uh, in the rods and cones. And the signals of these melanopsin containing ganglion cells are responsible for mediating the pupillary light reflex uh, for and then for other forms of non-image forming vision, like circadian rhythms, uh, photoperiod uh, calculation, uh, even mood. So uh, uh, we were curious to know whether uh, all of this exists in lamprey. And uh, so uh, Yuan Ping's lab uh, uh, looked to see if there were melanopsin containing ganglion cells uh, in our species of lamprey. Another group had previously shown that another lamprey had them, and uh, we had uh, no difficulty finding uh, labeling um, ganglion cells that express melanopsin. Uh, and so uh, the question then became, well, are, are these melanopsin uh, containing ganglion cells used for anything? Do lamprey have non-image forming vision? And so Al uh, anesthetized some lamprey, put, him, put them under the dissecting microscope, uh, turned on, uh, a bright light, and this is what happened. The pupils was constricted. Now, it's not a big effect. It's only about a 50% change at most in the area of the pupil, uh, and it's very slow, uh, much slower uh, than in, in us. In us, uh, the, the entire effect is over uh, in a second at most, okay? Um, in uh, a lamprey, uh, it takes a minute for half the uh, change in area to occur. But nevertheless, it's there. The lamprey have a pupillary light reflex, and so uh, is it mediated by melanopsin? Well, to uh, investigate that possibility, um, Alla uh, did what, uh, what you could call an action spectrum, a spectral sensitivity curve. He used a bunch of different wavelengths of light to produce the pupillary light reflex, measured their sensitivities, uh, and this is now the uh, uh, lambda, the, the absorbance curve of melanopsin peaking at 480 nanometers. And that's where it peaks in us and in a mouse. And another group has shown uh, again a different species of lamprey, but nevertheless, uh, a lamprey um, has its uh, melanopsin peak at the same wavelength. And, and the fit is quite good. But the remarkable thing is that if we plotted response intensity curves for all the different wavelengths, they fell along the same curve. and the responses were extremely uh, insensitive. And, and there was no indication out here in the red of a contribution from the cones, and certainly none from the rods. So the, the, this is quite unlike uh, in, in us. Uh, in, in us, rods and cones contribute to the pupillary light reflex, 
um, and the melan option containing ganglion cells seem to have uh, mostly uh, a, an effect uh, in very bright light. Whereas in lamprey, it's only this very bright light response which is present. Uh, and that brings, uh, uh, that raises the possibility that this is a primitive form of uh, um, non image forming vision in which the melanopsin containing ganglion cells uh, have a photopigment and respond to light, uh, but all by, but this pigment all by itself is modulating, uh, the, uh, is producing the non image forming vision uh, without any input from the rats and cows. All right. So this is the, uh, the list of characters that. Uh, uh, the, the top row were the people who actually did, <laughs> did all the experiments. Ricard uh, and an undergraduate, very talented undergraduate, uh, Sonia, who, who uh, um, did all those recordings, and there were quite a lot of them. And then uh, Tong Zhu Shu, who, who did the uh, uh, HPLC retinoid measurements. And the, the, these are the people I work with. Uh, they're all uh, they're all known to you, I'm sure most of you. Um, but um, most important in my life is Sam, who uh, invited me into his laboratory uh, when I retired. We assembled these uh, investigators, comes down to the lab we're used to before the pandemic. Uh, and uh, uh, first thing in the morning, then we'd all sit around in a circle and we'd talk about results. Um, uh, prods us, keeps everything focused, uh, and somehow has time to run basic science uh, at the Jewel Stein. So my, my debt to Sam is really uh, enormous, uh, and um, uh, this is just a wonderful way uh, to uh, to work in my retirement. So my advice to you, uh, all of you uh, senior investigators, uh, is take good care of your students and then cross your fingers really hard. <laughs> uh, and that's all I have to say. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, you know, maybe we start with questions which are already posted, and uh, please uh, send as well more questions. So we start with Brother Anand. Yeah, hi, Gordon. Uh, wonderful, hi. wonderful talk. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, I have a very sort of naive question. In molecular biology, you know, we have been doing all these experiments and RT-PCR, and we find this weird looking isoforms, you know, RNA isoforms that are much smaller number, but when you do immunoblots, you never end up seeing any proteins and we ignore them. And, and we say, oh, they must be very small, small amount and they may not be doing anything. I was just wondering that, is it possible that maybe uh, for either the opsins or transducin, there might be some isoforms of these pigment and these gene, uh, these proteins that are being formed, they are much, much smaller in number and they can be, can be generated even in some of the knockout or other mice that you're using. And they don't behave in the same way because they may lack certain domains or amino acids that are or residues that might be sort of relevant for appropriate functioning. Under normal circumstances, you may not be seeing them, but when you have all of those things missing, then this 10, 15% or 0.1% actually response that you're getting is really coming from those things that we always ignored. And, and you know, maybe there's some relevance to that. I, I don't know if it, it, it makes any sense. Well, I, uh, you know, I don't know either really. Um... Uh, the, the pigment regeneration part of the story is kind of a mystery. Certainly one thing that kept, kept me up at night uh, was, uh, could these responses uh, be actually cones? Uh, could there be a small amount of cone response uh, even in the GNAT1, uh, the GNAT2 knockout animals? Um, because as, as, as we all know, uh, these, uh, when we do these knockouts, we expect that we, we just uh, completely alone, we completely delete the gene, but that's an assumption. Uh, often, um, which uh, uh, given the circumstances of our experiments, um, we uh, could call into question, okay? So I think the experiment that, that uh, uh, let me uh, sleep a little more soundly is the A3C experiment, because uh, uh, as uh, uh, Vadim's lab has shown, the transducin uh, 
it doesn't translocate in cones. And so the A3C uh, uh, and the A3C experiment is spe was specifically done for, for gene at one for the rods. It was ex specifically expressed in the rods. Nevertheless, we got a very large effect. Okay, so I think this, this pretty much uh, um, eliminates the possibility that somehow uh, we're getting bleeding from this deletion in a small cone response. The kinetics of the response also look like rods rather than cones. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think, um, I, I, I think we're, we're, we're probably okay there. Um, but for the mechanism of regeneration, uh, you know, um, I just, I don't know. This is something that we, uh, maybe Chris has an idea. I, um, we, we don't know how to, we don't know what experiment even at this point to do. Steve Pietler. I'm sorry? I'm calling Steve Pietler. Yeah, hi, Gordon. Uh, uh, great talk. Uh, so just a quick question. Yeah, and, and it looks like someone else, Thomas Redman, asked something uh, closely related. So, but could there be a sequestered pool of love and cis retinal uh, in the outer segments that is released that for some reason we haven't been able to detect? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, well, uh, you know, actually, we think there is a, a small pool of retinal uh, in the outer segment, uh, but it's very small. And the, the MSP measurements, the, the, the excellent agreement of uh, the MSP measurements with the, um, with the uh, uh, photosensitivity equation uh, would indicate that um, uh, that, that we're really bleaching the pigment in the way we think we're bleaching. The, a small amount of a sequestered uh, 11 cis, um, you know, uh, you, you could say, well, what well, suppose it's released over a very sli a slow time course. But, but Steve, you know, we've done these recordings uh, in the presence of, of uh, 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 very bright light for four hours. And we're still getting responses. So, um, uh, I, I don't think that's uh, that's very likely. All right. Uh, how about Greg? Greg, are you there? I'm here. Um, so I have kind of a hybrid question comment that that gets at this um, that gets at this issue also, and and that has to do with this source of very low quantities of um, of chromophore. Um, and, you know, the, the question slash comment is that you had indicated that, that you felt that there was a very low likelihood that it was coming from a photoisomerization um, because the, at the wavelength that you were using was so far outside of the visible spectrum of retinal. Um, but I guess there, there's the, the comment part of this is that you know, there's a there's a paper from Chris's lab that I'm also an author on that we were trying to develop just a chemical method to make nine cis retinoids, and what we found was that um, for nine cis retinal acetate, which the lambda max on that is 325, we would get way outside of the visible spec, the visible absorption spectrum, and that's when we started getting the most efficient isomerization. Like we went up into the 400s and we were still getting isomeriz isomerization efficiencies up to like 20%. Mm -hmm. So like our, you know, our best results were at 385. And so if you look at the visible spectrum of retinal acetate, 385 is at the very lowest part. So it doesn't make any, any sense at all. And we were getting conversions of like 65 to 70% at that point. So I think that I think that it's it's actually a reasonable hypothesis that your baseline conversion is actually from the light, and um, and the and you know the difference between the isomers is only like a half a kcal. So I, I I think that it's I think that it's actually a reasonable hypothesis that your baseline um, isomers might be coming from light, and that's again just a. Just a, I can send you the paper if you're curious. Um, again, so it's sort of a question, sort yeah, of a yeah. comment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, if, if the lambda max of the effect 
uh, is uh, in that region, okay? Um, uh, or, or, or even, uh, you know, anything below 500 even, we're stuck. And the reason why is that, uh, you know, we've done uh, practically all the experiments that I've shown has been done with a, a wavelength of five, between 560 and 570 nanometer uh, light. So you could say, well, look, uh, why don't you go to even uh, uh, longer wavelengths? And maybe you could uh, eliminate uh, the, the effect that you're seeing because you're going to be even further away from the lambda max of the effect. The problem is that you also are further away from <laughs> the, uh, the pigment absorption spectrum and <laughs> the two decline uh, in about the same. So you have to increase your light. If you go further in the red, you have to increase your light to get the same bleach. And if you increase your light, you, 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 see, the, you see the problem. I, yeah, no, I think that the, the challenge that you're running into, honestly, is this, is this problem of the, the difference in energy between your cis and trans isomers is only a half a kcal. That's, that's where your real kind of fundamental issue is, is, is that that thermodynamic difference is just so, it's not that big. I mean, it's big enough for, for it to be kinetically stable long enough for physiologic processes. But once you get into this photoisomerization problem, you might just end up having this certain percentage. But again, uh -huh. just, that's just my thought from going through these studies with Chris. Thank you, Greg. Uh, let's move to Professor Kaiser. Hi, Gordon. Uh, it was, uh, I really enjoyed the talk. It was like a great mystery novel. I was on the edge of my seat the whole time. Um, and I, I think it's really great that you guys have uh, expanded on the work about the, the rod escape from desensitization and get, getting to a mechanism um, for that. So my, my question again, is, it's related to this um, mis mystery source of visual pigment. Um, I, what your, your results got me thinking about cones and you know what you think um, if the same, whatever the source of chromophore is, uh, if that's operative in cones, how much that might contribute to the cones, cone, the cone cells ability to remain responsive to very, very bright light. And, you know, if you had any sort of estimate as to what a potential contribution uh, that that might um, make um, in addition to the RGR and the NREP mechanisms that you guys and, and Chris have, uh, have, have worked on. Uh -huh. uh, well, um... Uh, I think these are extremely interesting questions and cones really uh, have, uh, I mean, I could give a whole nother seminar about cones. Cones have been very understudied and, and um, uh, there's some really important outstanding problems. I, I would say that the um, work we've done with, uh, with Gabe uh, has shown that uh, uh, cone regeneration can occur through the RGR opsin uh, pathway, um, uh, and and by uh, formation of uh, of NRED PE of, of uh, the chromophore attaching to uh, ethanolamine, and uh, that the, the, we have we have actual experiments indicating that these the NRED PE pathway can tr can contribute to cone regeneration um, for for rods. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, we've uh, exposed uh, the retinas to uh, 470 nanometer light or 560 nanometer light, and we see almost no difference uh, in the extent of regeneration. The MSP data look almost or almost superimposable, and the the avoidance of saturation, the, the kinds of data that I showed at the beginning of the talk are almost uh, identical. So uh, the, what is happening in rods and cones, I think, could be uh, quite different. And, and what I think one of the outstanding questions here for both rods and cones is uh, what are the contributions of these various mechanisms, uh, uh, especially for cones? What is the contribution of the, the RGR ops and the NRE PE, the, 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 the uh, RP65, uh, the, the regular uh, um, generation of pigment that is occurring in the RPE? What are all the contributions of these various mechanisms in the intact animal? I think that's a, a really uh, important question, which uh, we're all going to have to think about and face. Uh, and I don't think any of us knows at this point. 
Gordon, before we move to France, uh, who was on the list, I had a question, but I didn't post it on my chat for myself. So I, let me ask you all, um, uh, one question and one comment. I think in terms of uh, vitamin A deprivation, the RPE65 is not the best model because it takes almost two or three generations to completely um, kind of deprive them uh, of um, vitamin A. The best model is LRAP because without keeping it in the liver and in the RPE, you can very quickly deprive them of any presence of retinoids. I think that's a better model. But I, I uh, just um, as we're working on RGR and, and you published this wonderful paper in Neuron, uh, the difference in uh, spectrum, uh, the power spectrum between what you guys have published and what we have is a huge difference in lambda maximum. Uh, did you think about that and how could you, uh, you know, what you will attribute to those differences? Well, uh, unhappily, Chris, I'm going to have to say that that's a question for Gabe, really. I haven't, no. Uh, can you do me a favor, actually? Uh, what I would appreciate is if you could get me to focus on just exactly this problem um, by uh, just, uh, is this the paper that you could, uh, so, um, you've had several papers on this question as well as review. Uh, wh which paper do I look at of yours? JGP, December last year. Does he, in JGP? JBC. JBC, December of last year. All right, uh, I will uh, I will look at that and, and think about it, okay? Okay, thank you. Franz. Yeah, hi, Gordon, thank you. For the great presentation and acknowledgement, I don't deserve all the all the credit for that, but that was nice. Uh, so actually, you already talked about this, but that's what I was going to ask. That if if you looked at the spectral sensitivity of this rod pigment regeneration, but you kind of already answered that, and you think it cannot be that N red P pathway. Did uh, I answer so uh... correctly? Um, uh, yeah, so uh, am I, I'm still sharing, am I? Can yes, you see? Yes, you do. Uh, all right, so this, these are uh, some uh, experiments that Bikar did. That, so this is uh, the same kind of uh, isolated A-wave um, uh, recordings, um, but um, with uh, either 560 or uh, 450 nanometer light. Uh, uh, these are uh, the uh, MSP measurements, uh, maybe there's a slight difference, but there, there isn't much, and it's not statistically significant. And then these are uh, uh, RGR knockouts, ABC, A4 knockouts. Uh, the regeneration uh, is uh, uh, pretty similar. So um, that's, uh, you know, that's what we got at this point. Yeah, and in terms of relevance in vivo, you you said that you don't think this has any relevance in vivo, but those responses, they are still quite large and probably comparable to the cone responses. But I was wondering if you have tried the same experiment in, in vivo, in intact animal who is alive and whether it would make any difference because then you would have maybe even more pigment regeneration from RPE and then those, yeah. Would those keep actually rods saturated in vivo, even if in this isolated preparation they are not saturated? Yeah, uh, this is certainly something we've thought about. Uh, so uh, it's, what I'm showing here now are the um, uh, calculations uh, of the uh, um, uh, percent uh, uh, the fraction of pigment uh, bleached uh, in an intact animal, okay, uh, in from from about light of dawn to dusk to, to very bright light, uh, using um, uh, the, the calculations of uh, in uh, uh, a review article that Marie Burns and Ed Pugh wrote a few years ago, um, and then uh, using the uh, it's quite straightforward to calculate the steady state concentration of pigment if you know the regeneration time. And uh, I like Nikotimiev's uh, measurement that uh, regeneration in the intact animal has a time constant of 30 minutes. Of course, it's 
it's considerably less than us. It's about 400 seconds, but uh, it's very slow in mouse. Um, uh, from a review of, of uh, uh, AQ and Trevor Lamb, uh, the uh, kind of consensus value is 50 minutes for the regeneration time constant. But be that as it may, it is not really that important. You can see uh, what fractions of pigment uh, you'd expect to be bleached uh, in the mouse uh, under these conditions. Uh, and uh, then you can see in the isolated retina for the experiments that we did, uh, what the range of uh, uh, bleaching uh, would have been. And our, the range of bleaching in the isolated retina uh, overlaps the range of bleaching you'd expect in an intact animal uh, under uh, um, uh, you know, the conditions of illumination, which of course a mouse uh, doesn't go out uh, uh, if the light is that bright, it stays in its burrow. But um, um, you can, uh, uh, mutatis mutandis, you can, you can carry this argument over to human and uh, do the calculations over again. And th th really, uh, we're encompassing, our measurements encompass the range of uh, pigment uh, bleaching that uh, uh, is likely to occur uh, yeah, under uh, conditions of, of uh, normal conditions of illumination. So, so I don't think, if, if, so to, to summarize then, I don't think it makes any difference uh, that, that we recorded from isolated retina and not from the intact retina. Uh, certainly there's gonna be more pigment there uh, in the intact animal, but uh, the, the, we're already seeing the effects that we're seeing at uh, lights uh, uh, that uh, produce uh, pigment levels which are comparable to those produced uh, in the intact animal under steady state bleaching. So I, I'm pretty confident that... that uh, All right, uh, let's uh, move on. Uh, we have still a few questions and uh, um, Adriana, you have any comments? Looks like we lost her. How about Thomas Mike Redmond, I believe? Michael, are you there? Essentially, my question was answered. So it's not necessary. Thank you very much. Matthew. Unmute. Hello. Um, this is a really awesome talk. Thank you. Um, so can you hear me? I, yeah. Can you hear me? I okay. can hear you. Yeah. Um, so I was thinking about, and the opposite situation of bleaching, say like dark, um, prolonged darkness or even dark rearing, um, would you see some similar mechanism to the A3C, um, this, the, the uh, and sealated or? Hello? Um, yep. That's my question. Uh, so I, I guess I haven't understood. Um, uh, so the A3C animal, uh, Kept in darkness, is, mm -hmm. is, that, is that the idea? Or some kind of similar modification to the transducin, um, like the, the N-acetylation or, or palmitate. Yeah, uh, I think that there are opportunities here for further experimentation. I think the only concern I have is that if you make, if you add yet another uh, uh, acetylation site or another permethylation site and really lock that alpha transducin onto the disc membrane, my guess is the photoreceptors are going to degenerate super fast, unless you keep them in darkness. In darkness. <laughs> but you're, you're not considering that you make a modification which could have another cell biological problem. And yes. I, I think that strict uh, extrapolation is not valid. Sorry, Gordon, but we, may, we have to disagree from time to time. It's very rare, but we have to. <laughs> I, All right, you, let's move to Ben Lin. Yeah, uh, great talk. In fact, the uh, friends already asked the question, uh, but a little bit follow up. So, do you think the, is there any balance between the, the contribution of the RP and the mutant cells and in maybe in vivo? What do you think? So, right now, your eyes are RP, and do you think maybe the contribution of the Mueller, Mueller cells are big enough for completely replace the RP or what's the balance? What do you think? Well, uh, so um, 
if the Mueller cell uh, pathway is using uh, RGR option, which our data uh, would seem to indicate, we can exclude that possibility because we've used uh, uh, an RGR uh, opsin knockout animal and we don't see any difference in, uh, in the physiology or in the pigment uh, bleaching. Um, so um, now if there is another mechanism for rods in the Mueller cells, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I don't know what to say. Well, I, I guess the the the, in, uh, the, the other uh, the other observation I would add here, however, is that um, we we see uh, this almost an identical effect uh, recording from a single rod. All right, and and so I, I think that's uh, that, that's evidence that whatever is going on, uh, it's going on inside that rod itself. Uh, and, and doesn't require um, the uh, input from pigment regeneration from Mueller cells uh, or anything else. Um, the, the, the things are going to be a bit different if an RPE is there, of course. Uh, but uh, I think the basic phenomenon that we've described is probably happening within the rod. All right, let's have uh, one more comment from uh, Sasha and then final comments from Robert. So Sasha first and then uh, Robert Lucas. Uh, we'll close uh, the meeting today. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, beautiful talk, Gordon. I just want to comment briefly on the statement that you made that if you modify transducing in such a way that it would stay in the outer segment, uh, the photoreceptors would degenerate super fast. Uh, I doubt it would be the case because if you completely deprive what the receptor from cy cyclic GMP, you knock out both cyclases, they degenerate relatively slow. It's about in half, uh, they degenerate in, in about in a half and six months. So I wouldn't expect a very fast degeneration in that case. Yeah. Um, yeah, that point well taken. Okay, let's move uh, and thank you again, Gorgon, for wonderful presentation. But final comments will go to Robert. Hi, everyone. Yeah, Gordon, really excellent talk. Really, really love to see it come together. It's just really a comment. There was a question about whether this would happen in vivo. And just to say that we we quite independently saw exactly this sort of really, really slow recovery of a rod response of bright light recording in the LGN of, of mice and fully intact animals. So. I, it, it's, it's definitely a thing there. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. Let's unmute and thank you, Gordon. Thanks, My Robert. pleasure. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank, thank you. you Bye-bye. Thank you. Good to see you, Gordon. Good. Yeah. Hey. Oh, my God. Is that my <laughs> buddy, Dr. <laughs> Friesler? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you had me at Photon. 